Carl, for uh, coming to this week's uh, Joint Astrophysical Colloquium. It's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Jorik Wink from AMA Observatory. Jorik uh, did his PhD at the University of Utrecht um, before moving to the Imperial College in London in 2001 to the UK. And since then, he's been in one or the other parts of the UK. He's in 2005, he got an academic fellowship at Kiel University in England. And in 2007, he became then a research astronomer at AMA Observatory in Northern Ireland, where he has uh, made his career since then. In 2015 to 2016, he wasn't just a researcher, he was acting director of the planetarium in AMA. And in 2017, he received a visiting professorship at the University of Leeds, which he holds uh, since then. His main research interests, as uh, some of you might already know, are, of course, massive stars, stellar evolution and atmospheres of massive stars, to be more precise, up to all the way uh, in their life until explosion. Um, he has been the past president of the IAU Commission G2 on massive stars. He's organized several meetings, uh, IAU meetings included, and edited a number of textbooks and special issues, for example, on very massive stars, star formation in the UV, massive stars near and far, and winds and stellar interiors. And finally, he's currently PI of the large program that some of you might have heard for. It's called X-Shooting Ulysses. And he will actually tell us a bit more during his uh, colloquium talk today about what that means and why this is a very big and important project. So with that introduction, Jorik, you have the full audience and the microphone, so take it away. Thank you. Andreas. Well, Thank you very much for the invitation to come here to Heidelberg. I've already very much enjoyed the visit. Last time was in summer, but it was 40 degrees. So I actually prefer this. <laughs> so uh, the, mess the most massive star. So um, you may know that um, if you want to find a big fish, you need to go to a big pond. Yeah, so if you want to find a really big star, you need to go to a really big cluster. Yeah, so this is... Uh, R136 is the most massive cluster in our local universe, and this is hosting the most massive known star at the moment. But is that really the most massive star possible? Now you see this little plot here. Um, it's actually a little quiz. So what is plotted? I, can, I already give you the y-axis, it's stellar mass, or the x-axis, what is on the x-axis? Anyone? I... Sorry, it's not redshift, but that's a good idea. Um, maybe it helps if I say it doesn't go up to 30, it actually only goes up to 26. That's up to 26, it's the alphabet. So this is the most massive star claimed by the authors uh, in the alphabet. So if your name starts with an A or a B, you can claim thousand solar mass stars in the early universe. But if you only work locally and your name starts with C, then you can only go up to 300 solar masses. But this is still a factor two better than the previous limit of 150 solar masses that a lot of people are familiar with. And uh, yeah, obviously this is a high, heavily biased sample because Ralph uh, just told me about uh, uh, a million solar mass stars, but, but he's off the scale, so I can't, I can't put him there. So my own name is a V, so there's not much for me to gain here. So I don't really look at the most massive star, but the most massive mass loss. So if you have, my argument is that it doesn't really matter what your initial mass is. If your mass loss is high enough, then you can actually go backwards. And that is kind of the point of, of this talk. And what I will be arguing is that even if stars currently are only observed up to 200, 300 solar masses, say after one and a half million years, if you have really strong mass loss, it is maybe not the case that if you work backwards that the star originated only with 300, but it may well have had a thousand solar masses. If the star would have accumulated all that mass unimpeded. So if you could accrete at high enough rates or merge enough stars that potentially you can get very high mass to very high initial masses, but the star may already have started hydrogen burning and already start to burn to lose a lot of mass. And in fact, there's no reason why the masses would only start after hydrogen burning. This will already happen beforehand. And the reason why these mass loss rates are so high is because of the physics of these stars, that they're so luminous and very close to the energy limit. So to put this in a bit of a cosmic timeline, um, the Big Bang was only hydrogen and helium. 
And then after a couple of hundred million years, you have the first stars forming. Now, no one knows how massive these first stars were. Were they normal, saltpeter? Uh, were they top heavy? Supermassive stars that may have made the first supermassive black holes? Who knows? But what we do know is that these stars had very little metallicity. And probably that, that the star formation process will be linked to that metallicity. But what I will argue is also the feedback effect for the most massive ones, the stellar winds, is metallicity dependent. And therefore, what you see as a function of the rest of the universe in terms of what black holes do you get, what pair instability do you get, all the way, the whole chemical enrichment up to today will be dependent on metallicity. So if we are in a, in a, in a galaxy here, like in a Milky Way type galaxy, we have finite metallicity, solar metallicities, strong winds. And if we want to learn, we can do two things. If we want to learn about the first stars, we can, of course, do theory, or we can look backwards uh, to the early parts of the universe at Redshift 10, or we can look at nearby galaxies like the LMC and the SMC, which have also have lower metallicity, and learn about the physics of these stars. So um, just to introduce um, the concept of, of, of Redshift and metallicity, so if you are at high Redshift, on, on, this is all average, of course. In, in reality, the mass of the galaxy plays a role as well. But, but if you have really a high redshift, you have zero, zero metallicity. Yeah, so a little Z and big Z. Um, but the claim was a few years ago, there was this helium-2 emitter in a, a galaxy called CR7. Nothing to do with Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, uh, in any case, that, that, um, there was a very narrow uh, line. And the suggestion was this is very hot gas from the first stars. Zero metallicity stars will be hotter and may have ionized this line. But um, I, I'm not sure about this particular detection, and I'm, I'm not going to go into all the details. But the point is, I will come back to this at the end of the talk and come up with some alternative possibilities here. So just to outline, uh, I start with very massive stars. What are they? Do they even exist? Um, how much mass do they lose? What happens at low metallicity? Then this project that was discussed, so we move from theory to observations, and an outlook for a high redshift. So why would you want to be interested in not just massive stars, not O stars, but even more massive stars than O stars? O stars on steroids, I call them. What is so interesting about it? Well, they're brighter stars. They, um, therefore, you can see them at large, up to large distances, and they, their integrated light dominates um, star-forming galaxies at high redshift anywhere really. Um, then they have the chemical enrichment in winds and maybe supernovae for certain mass ranges. Um, they start these are strong winds, so they produce high m dots, mass loss rates, high wind velocities. So the kinetic energy goes with the velocity squared. So higher velocities means a lot more kinetic energy. And these stars are very hot, 50,000 Kelvin, produce a lot of ionizing radiation. And that's relevant for things like the reionization of the universe um, and ionization in nearby galaxies as well and this chemical enrichment. Now, people have asked, if you go to the first stars, is the IMF top heavy? Um, because the star formation, genes mass arguments, cooling arguments will tell you those stars should be heavier than today. Um, but I, I, I would say we don't know if there isn't even more, mass, more massive stars in the first stars, but at least we know very massive stars or at least very massive stars do exist. Gamma ray bursts have been observed, for instance, up to redshift of nine. So we know there's black hole formation of things like individual massive stars uh, that produce exotic phenomena such as superluminous supernova, gamma ray bursts, and so on. So we do need to know the properties of massive stars and very massive stars as a function of redshift. So another motivator, of course, is these days with the gravitational waves, with LIGO and Virgo. Really massive, heavy black holes are found, 30, 40 times the mass of the sun. And again, you cannot get a 40 solar mass black hole from a small star. You need really massive stars and probably much more massive than 40 because you need to go down to 40. So what do we know? Why, what tells us what the most massive star is? Some people say it's 120 because they've looked at the Geneva track and the top one is 120. Yeah. This is not a criticism of the Geneva people, but at the time there was no motivation to go to higher masses. Yeah. So that's of course not a very good argument, but we know that we have these stars that are what we call very massive stars, more massive than our stars, um, and they lose a, a lot of mass. So 
if you want to look at what is the most massive star, what sets the upper mass limit, from theory, you need to look at radiative accelerations. Now, um, <clears throat> the first feedback effect discussed 30, 40 years ago already for normal massive star formation is that of dust opacity. So if you have radiative acceleration uh, working outwards, you have the dust opacity and the flux over the speed of light. And if you write the flux as L over 4 pi r squared, you can have that uh, overcome your gravitational Newtonian GM over R squared. So if you divide the two, you get your Eddington factor. Um, and then nicely, the two R squares cancel. And then you just get an L over M ratio. Um, and a couple of constants that are in not so interesting. The only really interesting thing other than L over M is this little kappa here. And that's a really innocent looking kappa. And um, for dust, this could be relatively simple. But what I will argue here, if you want to look at the most massive stars that have very strong winds, then this kappa includes all the electron scattering, but also all the line opacity. And you really need to look at the fluctuated line opacity and, 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 and um, uh, the gas opacity, really. And that is really a difficult job to do. And you can do that with Monte Carlo calculations. I will discuss that. You can do it in other kind of calculations, non-LT calculations that Andreas performs here in Heidelberg. Um, but the point is that when you get close to this Eddington limit, you really need to understand these, uh, these physical effects. Um, from star formation theory, people thought that maybe radiation pressure on dust would already limit the mass of stars. But then when people do the 2D, 3D calculations, you could actually um, uh, accrete the material, say, from the disk, and the radiation would go out from the poles. So you could grow your star to much higher masses than the 10, 20 solar masses that was initially thought to be the case because of this radiation pressure barrier. That, not, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. In principle, my understanding is that if you, even if you include most, most feedback effects, um, if your, your initial cloud is large enough, you could form an unlimitedly large uh, massive star. So there doesn't seem to be a limit from theory. Observations then, as I said, big fish, big pond. R136 was thought to be a 3,000 solar mass star. And then people started to do high resolution imaging, and suddenly the, the star that was the ones to be, was thought to be 300 solar mass, uh, 3,000 solar masses, suddenly was only 100, 150. Um, and in fact, A1, which is the most massive star we know of, turns now, to, now out to be um, a visual binary. So this star has now been resolved. So people are starting to wonder again, okay, uh, maybe in 10 years and 20 years, there will be even higher resolution data and the, the upper mass limit will come down again. And, and I will argue here that that's not going to be the case. And I'll explain why. So if you plot these luminosities in a hertzberg russell diagram, um, like stellar astronomers like to do, this is uh, up to 10 million luminosities and you see stars of 200, 300 solar masses for the for these stars in the core of R136. So we know from the luminosity argument that these stars are 200, 300 solar masses. If we look at the integrated light of a cluster like R136, it turns out these stars dominate. They dominate everything. So here you have a UV spectrum. This is everything in R136. And here is a, um, um, a, dis a contribution from very massive stars. So the seven very massive stars in this cluster dominate about only maybe 30% of the light, whereas 63 normal O stars do slightly more. Uh, so it's 10 times more stars, but they, their contribution is slightly, only slightly increased. So they, they already contribute a lot to the light, but then there's something very specific happening at this wavelength here. It's a helium-2 line, broad helium-2 line, um, that's totally absent for O stars, but is very strong for these very massive stars. So if you look at the integrated light, the helium-2 emission in R136 is totally dominated by very massive stars. It's all very massive stars. Um, and that is relevant for this thing that I mentioned. Um, so integrated light. The point is that from the integrated light, we know that because these stars have these strong emission lines like this helium-2 emission, that because we have spectra and not just photometry, we know that these stars are very special. They are not just normal O stars. And, 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 and a star like this, 
a ball variation type star, even if you start resolving it sp spatially, the, the spectrum is not going to change, it's not to suddenly become an absorption line so star. So a 300 cellular mass star is never going to turn into 10, 30 cellular mass stars. These stars really are very massive, and therefore I argue the very massive stars exist, even if that's wrong, the book exists. Yeah. So um, if you're interested in the physics of these very massive stars need energy limits, then um, have a look at some of these chapters about the formation of these stars, or, or my own chapter on the mass loss properties, etc. Um, um, and I will talk about some of these aspects in this talk. Now, as I, say, I keep saying that the mass loss dominates the evolution of these stars, and, and what, what is that called? It's called the Conti scenario, that for massive stars at above a certain mass, so I'm not talking about a 20 or 25 solar mass stars, those are low mass stars, and they are, they're very interesting. They make wet supergiants. Uh, there's a lot of questions about whether the wet supergiant mass loss rates are high enough to make all very stars. It might, need, it might be the case, very likely you need a binary to remove the hydrogen envelope and make stripped stars. Yeah? But above a certain mass, and there's still discussion about exactly where that mass is, is that at 25 or is that at 40? But above a certain mass, the winds are strong enough uh, to remove all their mass, and then they become also unstable when they, when they reach this observed Humphreys-Davidson limit, which is the Eddington limit, and they lose so much mass that they make these Wolverine type stars. These are classical Wolverine stars. So these are evolved stars. These are helium burning stars, just like red supergiants are helium burning stars. These are helium burning stars. Whereas the, the WN stars that I talked about, these very massive stars, they're hydrogen burning stars, these are O stars and steroids. So there's a distinction between those type of Wolverine stars. So that is the scenario, the Conti scenario. Uh, you basically have a star that's evolving. Now, for the sun, most of the evolution is driven by what happens in the core, by the, by the, by the, by the nuclear synthesis in the core. The mass loss rate of the sun, 10 to the minus 14 solar masses per year, even over a lifetime of um, uh, 10 billion years, you only lose 10 to the minus 4 solar masses in total. That's negligible. These stars, they lose half their mass, 90% of the mass for the most massive ones. So the evolution is mostly dominated by this mass loss. And for the most massive ones, I can really say that the evolution is basically the mass loss. Once you know the mass loss rate, these stars are chemically homogeneous. You can exactly work out what the evolution is, but you need to know, you know exactly how much mass you lose. So what happens to such a star? If you had no mass loss, you would just collapse into a intermediate mass black hole. If you had modest mass loss rates that some people are arguing for, and this might be the case at low metallicity, you could get into a regime of these pair instability supernovae, you have no black hole left. You just all the elements are, are are lost into space, and you have a lot of chemical enrichment. If you have high mass loss rates that I would argue for, you lose all that mass. You evaporate the stars, and you just have very have very low masses, and most of your mass is is enriching. So this is not a simple question. Um, it has huge consequences for the chemical enrichment in the universe, whether these stars exist or not, because one pair instability supernova of 260 solar masses will produce more metals and an entire IMF below it. So even though there's more three solar mass stars, it doesn't matter. One pair instability supernova will dominate this. So the theory then of these winds uh, developed in the, in the 1970s, um, it's about radiation pressure. So you have photons and you have atoms. Um, and it turns out to be particularly iron. But if the photons are intercepted, by atoms in the atmosphere, then they re-emit, are re-emitted. So in the scattering process, you, you, you accelerate some of these uh, atoms. And if they overcome gravity, then you get an outflow. And that depends, therefore, the rate of the mass loss depends then on the metallicity. If you have more iron, you get more scatterings and you get more acceleration. But also, the luminosity plays a role. Often people think it's only the luminosity, but it's also the mass. because. Um, the luminosity just produces more photons, but the mass, the lower the mass, the easier it is to escape the potential well. So the, both the luminosity and the mass are relevant. And the temperature is relevant as well, because the temperature sets the ionization stratification in the atmosphere, and it will decide which lines are contributing to the line acceleration. Um, and that will then all, de determine uh, all kinds of interesting phenomena also in the, in the hessel russell diagram, where the mass of weights can go up when you have changes in the ionization. I won't talk about that today. So if you do this in a Monte Carlo way, that is one way in which you can introduce uh, multiple scatterings. 
So this, this scattering process happens many times, and that way you can actually produce more momentum than uh, the radiation field had available. So if you have a radiation field per second of L over C in terms of its momentum, because of this multiple scattering process, you can actually have M dot V infinity that exceed that. So the wind efficiency can cross unity. And you might think that's rather odd, but you can actually work out that that's the case. So imagine you had one photon that was scattering, that was that was traveling this direction and scattering and, and, and ejecting this atom over here. And then that same photon travels backwards and does the same thing on, on the other side, on the other hemisphere, yet again. You've used the same photon twice. So if you keep doing that, hemispheric scattering, you could pump up the eta to any value you like. The reality is then set by the photon free path. It turns out that if you use realistic line lists that the photons don't travel that far, they are intercepted earlier. And then the real situation is this kind of, yeah, what do you call it? Uh, scattering process, I would call it. No? But, 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 but with the cumulative effect of all these scatterings still produces m dot v infinities larger than unity, or uh, eta is larger than unity. So in my thesis, I calculate a large grid of these kind of models over the entire HRD. A master's recipe has been used a lot in cell evolution, still being used today. Um, but questions are, is that still correct? Can we improve on this? Um, and, and what about other parameter ranges? Um, for instance, where, where are the masses of the very massive stars? So if we go to higher masses, higher than traditionally thought to be the case, it turns out that the masses rates are much higher, predicted to be much higher than for normal O stars. So here is something like a mass loss rate versus gamma. So higher gamma is higher mass stars, the more luminous stars. And as I, as I said, the O stars are here, but the most luminous, most massive stars are these WNH stars, nitrogen-rich, hydrogen-rich, Wolverine stars. The slope changes. There's a kink here. This is going with a, the with a power two, and this suddenly goes to the power five. Yeah. So it is not just the case that very massive stars have higher mass loss rates because you just have the continuation of this relation, but you have an enhanced mass loss because of multiple scattering. And that also means that the helium-2 um, line, both in the UV and in the optical, this is an optical helium-2 line, uh, increases more and more and more. So, so when you have a low gamma situation, you have only a little bit of emission, and then the more you pump up gamma, the higher the helium-2 emission. So this helium-2 emission is a very good indicator of where we are in gamma space, and therefore in mass space. Um, we did we tested these things in the VFTS, the, the VLT tarantula survey of that same region, and we found with um, analysis with non-alt eco CMF gen, um, uh, Joachim Bestenlener, um, that uh, indeed when he analyzed these stars, there is a kink with much higher mass loss rates for the most massive stars. And um, that means that we now really want to include this physics in stellar evolution models because both theory and observations give us these uh, indications of these enhanced mass loss. Um, there's a specific, a specific physical criterion that is reached at that kink. And I call that the eta equals tau equals one criterion. Um, eta is this wind efficiency, tau, is the optical depth of the wind. So O stars are optically thin and these wolf races are optically thick. Um, and you may wonder about why is that the case? Well, you need to have the equation of motion and integrate it. Um, and then you this just rolls out analytically from the calculation, uh, for, yeah, from an analytical calculation that you can loop in that paper. But basically we know that the mass loss rate is pretty well constrained at this point where the winds change their physics. Um, and that is, as, as I said, it's that wind efficiency eta crosses unity um, at, at high uh, gamma values. So when you have this equation, this really innocent looking a eta equals tau equals one relation, that just means that the mass loss rate is now just simply given by the luminosity of a star, speed of light, and the wind velocity. The wind velocity you can measure in the UV from P-Sydney lines. So that's an observed number, very accurately known, relatively, compared to mass loss rates. Um, C is the constant. So if you measure the luminosity of these stars, which is not a given because you need to do non LTE physics, you need to make sure you get your extinction right and everything, but it is something that we can measure quite reliably, much more reliably than the mass loss rate. 
because the mass loss rate in stars, we now know stars have winds that are not homogeneous, they're clumped. That means that photons can go through the clumps. That means there's porosity. There's, there's all kinds of complicated effects happening. And none of that matters for this transition mass loss rate. This is a calibrator, in my view. And so although the mass loss rates of, of normal massive stars are uncertain because of wind clumping, at the transition point, the mass loss rate is as accurately known as the solar wind mass loss rate. That is quite remarkable, I think. Okay, now we are actually including all these mass loss rates in stellar evolution. And, and why do we do that? Well, there's a very good reason for this. Because if you don't, you run into a problem. So here we have the uh, really upper HRD, again, 10 million solar luminosities. Um, and if you plot all the really massive stars for different regions, in the LMC, in the galaxy, um, uh, the Crowder ones from the from the from the from the uh, the R one three six, then you see they all have a really narrow temperature range. Yeah, they all have the same temperature. They're all about fifty thousand Kelvin, thereabouts. Yeah? But if you look at stellar evolution models and you don't do any tricks, that's an important point. If you don't do any tricks in your stellar evolution, and what do I mean with tricks is that when you get close to the Eddington limit, your envelope wants to inflate like crazy yeah. um, because you get close to the Eddington limit. Um, but um, if you don't, and this is what uh, people who do MESA modeling, then they may know of something called MLT++. If you switch that on, you can resolve this problem, but you've just avoided the, the, the fact that you're becoming super adiabatic. You, you're, 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 um, maybe I should, I hear I have this. So, these, these, these envelopes in a 1D stellar evolution without tricks, yeah, if you plot your density versus your radius, you have sort of what is called a core halo structure. You have your core, and then you have this very low density, very long inflated envelope, and then you get a density inversion. This is what you would get from a, a, a simple 1D stellar evolution model above the energy limit. All right. um, but we don't always see this in nature. Maybe we see it for LBVs. Maybe LBVs actually do this, and then they remove that again. And I, this is maybe why they are variable. Huh? But in principle, normal stars, when we look at these most massive stars, they have constant temperatures, and they're all very, very um, um, hot. So if you run a cell evolution model, the, the, the star would fly to the red supergiant regime, and we don't see stars above the red supergiant humphreys davids limit. So what other than tricks like MLT++ can we do to resolve this problem? Well, we in include these higher mass loss rates. So now that's what we have done. That is uh, my PhD student, Gautam Sabahit and, and, and Aaron Higgins uh, and Andreas. And we have included this in stellar evolution models for 1,000 solar mass stars, 500 solar mass stars, et cetera. And what do you get for your low mass stars, your 100 solar mass stars? You have classical evolution. Yeah. Oops. Um, stars actually do become red, or want to go red, but a thousand solar mass star has such a high mass loss rate that they don't evolve horizontally, they evolve vertically. The, because of the huge mass loss, the, the mass and the luminosity drop like crazy, so you get vertical evolution. So all these stars, if they exist, of course, but <laughs> at least the ones down here do exist, but in principle, all these stars drop like crazy in luminosity. And that is a natural explanation for why all these temperatures are constant. And this problem of all this constant temperature is resolved. Sorry. So vertical evolution, high mass loss. If you have that high kind of mass loss, and you now plug this into um, a stellar evolution code in terms of the mass evolution, you can also see after one and a half million years, you have, a, you, have, you have a convergence point, yeah? Um, you don't remember if you were 200 solar masses or 1,000 solar masses. Yeah. Now, we already knew that from, from these earlier mass loss calculations, but that was not including the actual stellar evolution. We now included the actual stellar evolution. These stars really are chemically homogeneous, and now we really know that we really cannot tell um, the, the initial mass function. But the consequence of this kind of belief is that we shouldn't be talking about an initial mass. You should talk about an effective initial mass. And this is for high metallicity. At a low metallicity, because of the radiation driven winds, this effect will also occur, but at a different mass. So the effective initial mass limit will be metallicity dependent. 
So these stars evaporate, at least for solar metallicity. Unless, as I said, we go to low metallicity. Yeah? So let's look at metallicity. Um, the low metallicity universe is different. Yeah? There are long gamma ray bursts that prefer low metallicity. Superluminous supernovae prefer low metallicity. There's helium-2 emitters in low metallicity galaxies. You don't see at high metallicity. Um, and what is the main physics causing this? Quite likely to be this metallicity dependent winds. As you get heavier black holes and that everything else kind of falls into place as a result of that. So that will be interesting also to link that to these gravitational wave events. So what drives uh, a wind? I, I said iron, but then people remember that, okay, but stars also produce their own metals. Um, hydrogen burning produces some extra nitrogen due to the CCNO cycle, but the nitrogen goes up, the carbon and oxygen come down. And atomic structure wise, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen are quite similar. So that won't help you much. But if you have helium burning, you produce carbon, carbon is a metal, you could potentially get lots of opacity from that. And the trick in terms of the opacity calculation, which element dominates is to look at the, 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 the solar abundance, the relative abundance and the number of lines. If you have a simple atom like carbon or hydrogen, you only have a few lines. If you have iron, you have a very complex atomic structure, you have millions of lines. So it turns out that it is these iron elements that dominate. Why? Not because they're so abundant, because they're for every iron atom, um, there's 2,500 hydrogen atoms in the galaxy, but because of these millions of lines. So we, 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 we can also infer from that that these Wolverine winds, they are driven by iron. And that means that is the initial metallicity of your host galaxy. So in the SMC, which is a lower metallicity, you will have lower mass loss rates than in the galaxy. And that would not be the case if carbon was driving the winds. No? So this was uh, going back to, to older um, work already from the, from the, from the 80s. Um, but the, for instance, the Geneva group, if you, if you make a, a, a Kippenhahn diagram, the, the plot the mass versus the time, uh, a 60 solar mass O-star loses a lot of mass. But the important point is that at the WC phase, this carbon-rich phase, 40% of your atmosphere is, is, is metals, is carbon. Yeah. So people thought these stars had really high mass loss rates because of the carbon. And that means that the metallicity, that these stars would not be metallicity dependent because these stars make their own metals. And that's not the case. If you, if you, if you do this with, with the iron abundances, we do now realize that um, it really depends on which galaxy, galaxy you're sitting. So there is a metallicity difference between stars in the early universe and today's universe because of the initial metallicity. So you have an iron abundance. And if you want to do this better, then um, Andreas is working on this now with uh, uh, power models, non-LTE models, and it isn't always even just a power law. Um, below a certain um, uh, gamma, a mass luminosity, this actually starts to fall off, and there's all kinds of interesting effects uh, to do with, uh, with Wolverine stars and strip stars. Now, what is the relevance for this for these black holes? Um, if you had black hole masses versus metallicities, for stellar mass black holes. Right? Um, this was a uh, this was the first gravitational wave event. I forgot the telephone number. GW15 or something, I think it was. But in any case, it was a 40 solar mass and a 30 solar mass star. And um, they had this nice plot. And they were arguing somehow it had something to do with the, weak, the wind strength. And that is not correct. At, at high metallicity, you, as you can see, these two, these two lines still produce uh, only a 10, 15 solar mass black hole. Because at high metallicity, you lose so much mass that even if you start with 100 solar masses, your black hole, the most ma ma massive black hole is only 15 solar masses. But the reason is that these Wolverine winds are metallicity dependent. So in the old population synthesis models, um, it didn't matter whether in the galaxy or at the 10th solar or 100 solar, the, the, the masses were never much higher than 10, 20 solar masses. So to, to explain these 40 solar mass black holes, you really need to go to a metallicity. You need to, you need to include Wolf, Wolverine metallicity dependence, and you need to go to metallicity down to about 10% solar. Um, then you can potentially explain these kind of events, these really heavy black holes. Um, now, that was the first one. There's now a whole range of them. 
And uh, the most interesting one from my perspective was the heaviest one up, up in the top. And um, it was a, there was a press release a couple of years ago now about GW190521. <laughs> I remember that one now. Um, that, that, that contained an 85 solar mass black hole. Oopsie daisy. Yeah. Now, an 85 solar mass black hole is in what would be normally considered this regime where you get this parent stability, supernovae. Um, that, that occurs above between 50 and 120. Um, so people were arguing, well, maybe you need to have uh, mergers of earlier, earlier mergers to create these 85 solar mass uh, events, uh, these black holes, and then merge again. So you have multiple generations of mergers. And I can't exclude that possibility, but do we actually need that? Can we not make an 85 solar mass black hole from stellar evolution? And the, the, the answer is we can do that. We need two key ingredients, and that is a relatively small core and a low metallicity environment. And when we do that, we have a blue supergiant progenitor for like a hundred solar mass star at about 100 solar, a blue supergiant, then you can avoid that these stars get dust driven strong mass loss in the red. And we can actually keep them blue and relatively compact. When I say compact, I mean, they're still quite big, but they don't, they don't grow like to thousands of, 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 of radii, solar radii, there's the hundreds. And it's actually quite easy, they're compact enough that all this material actually ends up in the black hole. So we have solved a couple of problems about um, uh, reaching some fundamental um, CO core mass of about 37 solar masses. We can stay below that. So we have a relatively small-ish core of 37 solar masses, but then a huge hidden envelope of another 50 solar masses on top of it. And that can all collapse potentially to an 85 solar mass black hole. Now, if that's true, then we can actually make this, this, this function of this black hole mass as a function of metallicity or cosmic time. Yeah? In, the, in the solar case, the, 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 most, the heaviest black hole will still be set by winds, but at metallicity below about a tenth, then suddenly this, this new limit is at about 90 solar masses. Uh, and that is twice as high as, as what was thought to be the previous limit. Well, so, uh, stellar evolution, as I will argue, is clearly not yet fully understood. Or not at all yet. <laughs> yeah. So we need to understand the interiors of stars and the winds of stars to make these kind of things properly. Okay, that is the theoretical part. Now, how do we test any of this? Um, ideally, we have large samples. These are massive stars. They're quite rare. We don't have huge samples. Um, we want to have large numbers of stars, observations, but we also want to have the best possible spectral analysis and fitting tools to not just get observations, but to actually have meaningful numbers with meaningful error bars that we can actually test the observations against theory. And that is the kind of philosophy behind projects like the PLT Flames Tarantula Survey, and now also with the X Shooting Ulysses project. Um, so these are massive stars in the in the Magellanic clouds at, at somewhat lower metallicity than our own. And we want to understand really from observations to constrain these mass loss rates, constrain the evolution. Are these low metallicity stars actually rotating faster? Are these exotic phenomena, these emerging black holes, gamma ray bursts indeed coming from these rotating stars, maybe, maybe mergers from binaries and all kinds of other physics that can be tested with, with a project like this. So this is 250 targets in two galaxies. Um, this is Ulysses is, uh, is a thousand orbits with the Hubble Space Telescope. Half of it is um, um, on Titori stars in our own Milky Way, but the other half is these massive stars. And they have really nice speckle resolution and, um, and signal to noise. So we wanted to have a complementary optical uh, and end near infrared uh, counterpart. And that is really where this X shooter instrument on VLT will help. And with this, we will get spectral libraries, not just for the UV, but also for the optical. Um, and then with um, these non-LTE codes, we can get homogeneous stellar parameters um, and mass loss rates and wind velocities from the ultraviolet, the P-Signy lines provide these. Um, why is all this necessary? Well, even if you want to only look at things like winds and mass loss rates, if you have one star sitting in the LMC and another star in the SMC, there's no guarantee that, that the evolution towards that point is the same. So there's multiple parameters 
that leading to these different things. So you will always have one star will have a certain mass luminosity temperature and another one a totally different one. So how can you compare these two? We really need to start to disentangle all these parameters and for that we need these large samples. So that's what we're doing. Um, now these are pre Ulysses results. So you say, how can you make an HRD when you haven't done this yet? Well, these are a very heterogeneous uh, literature study uh, samples and half of it is incomplete or doesn't exist at all. But what we can see is that um, the LMC sample is, is somewhat higher in mass and the SMC sample is somewhat lower in luminosity and mass. So we can test different things. I think for the LMC sample, we can particularly analyze really things to do with the strong mass loss. And for the SMC, things to do with the fast rotation. Um, but we'll see what we, uh, what we learn from this. So we'll get all these parameters. We can make hasman russell diagrams. We get abundances like helium, nitrogen, CaO. We can test mixing. We have phi sine i. We can see rotational mixing works in massive stars. Um, and we get all these other parameters um, uh, as, a, as a result of all these analysis. Why do we need both the UV and the optical? Realize that um, different wavelength ranges give different constraints. So in the, in the UV, you have your carbon-4 lines. They have these strong p signy lines. But in the optical, we have hydrogen lines and helium lines that provide mass loss rates and clumping factors that you wouldn't get just from a UV analysis. So we really need all this. Also, you need the Balmer lines to get log G, to get masses. So uh, this is why we have this combined approach of ultraviolet and optical. OK, once we have all that, and we have an, a, an appropriate understanding of the mass loss rates as a function of metallicity, then we, well, the temperature is one of the parameters as well. We could potentially start attacking things like the helium 2 emission. Yeah? because when extragalactic people see helium-2 emission, if these lines are broad, they say it's stellar from the wind. If it's narrow, they say it's, it's, it's ionization. Yeah. Um, I'm not convinced by that, not in all cases. Um, because this helium-2 emission locally in the, in, the, in, the, in the R136 cluster, we, I already showed you that the, the very massive stars dominate this. And if you go to calculations from a couple of years ago, um, and you look at the helium-2 line, for high metallicity and low metallicity cases, you see this line becomes very narrow. And it may well be that stellar winds that are slower at low metallicity also produce nebular helium-2. Not, not nebular, but produce narrow helium-2 emission. So these kind of claims that these are population three stars that are very hot, maybe we have to think again, maybe in some cases, these are just slow winds from very massive stars. Um, and we really need to disentangle all these things. And that means we need much better population synthesis models. Um, up to now, very famous uh, population synthesis model called Starburst 99, up to recently at least, this only went up to 100 solar masses. It's now included. But yeah, that's a bit of a simple say to, to, to say binaries are included. There's lots of pathways for binaries, of course. So there will be many different ways to include binary evolution in these codes as well. But even in these codes, if you don't include the physics of these very massive stars pro properly, then you can include any binary you want, but you're not going to get the right result. So what is my point? Um, massive star evolution is, is still very incomplete, and we will not be able to get proper population synthesis models until we understand the stellar evolution, and in particular of the most massive stars because they dominate so much. Um, we will need these large samples. And um, what we can already know is that these massive stars are going to be very different at low metallicity. So what is my claim? I, 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 I hope, um, I, I can't give you the number, what is the most massive star currently known, but we do know very massive stars exist. And the upper mass limit is unknown. Yeah? Um, I think effective upper mass limit is a much better word. Um, where that lies, I also don't know. I just know the, I've identified the physics that will dictate this. Um, and I, th I think this will be metallicity dependent. And um, obviously, uh, these kind of studies will be very relevant um, for um, very early uh, galaxies uh, observed as JWST and so on. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Many thanks for this fascinating overview of what massive stars can do, how they become 
somewhat less massive and still a massive stars for me is low mass star formation person. Um, questions from the audience? Yes. Thank you very much, Jörg. Um, you've been talking a lot about line-driven winds. Um, can you comment also on eruptive mass loss and other phases and what's the role of that in uh, in some of these aspects? Yeah. Um, okay. So um, it's one. It's only one aspect. It's the one thing that we know is not listed dependent. Yeah. Now, there are other possible... Well, if it just had a single star, then uh, like Itakar went through an eruption 150 years ago and expelled maybe up to 10 solar masses. So that could be an eruptive event and we don't know what caused it. Um, so if those things are common, then that would be very important for mass loss. And that might not be metallicity dependent. Uh, it's less obvious that it is metallicity dependent. So one of the things to do by looking at different metallicities is actually to disentangle the metallicity dependent from the metallicity independent processes. Um, and then, of course, binary is the same thing. I mean, it's possible that you, in uh, certain cases, um, remove a hydrogen envelope uh, in a binary. Um, and unless binary formation is metallicity dependent, but there's probably there's probably single star reasons why binary evolution is going to be metallicity dependent because these 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 inflation effects might be metallicity dependent. But I think the the the, the eruptive nature of binary mass loss will be more. Metallicity independent. So I think there are ways to disentangle these different things. Next question goes to Saskia Hecker. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very nice talk. I'm not an expert, by the way, but uh, my question is on these models that you showed where it sent uh, uh, that you not go red, but you go blue. Mm -hmm. And then I saw luminosities or log luminosities of 7.7 .7 or a very high numbers. And I was wondering, because that would indicate that we can see that much more easily but in your observational plot there seemed to be a cut at uh, maybe 6.6 .6 or so oh, I can't yeah. recall the number so this is very rapid so this is just hypothetical that a thousand solar mass really exists what i'm saying is because we only know five or six of these at about 200 300 solar masses after one and a half million years i cannot tell you if that was the initial mass or if the initial mass was actually a thousand yeah, but, now, but, but my question is actually, if, if, if you theoretically predict so luminous beasts, whatever you want to call them, that would be easier to observe. But what yeah. are the limiting factors? Is that the number, the time, or are they obscured? So what could you say? Because, I mean, if they exist, we potentially can see one. We might be, we might be observing them, but, but more in integrated light. We just don't really know. When we look at young clusters far away, we don't immediately really know. I mean, if it was more local, of course, it could be hidden behind the dust. If this is a star formation event still, this all happens within one or two million years. So this will happen behind a lot of dust in many cases. So, so some of it might just be obscured from us. Uh, I'm not trying to say, uh, I'm trying to hide, uh, <laughs> hide the star, but it might actually be true. Maybe James Webb will help because he can pierce much deeper into the you know cloud that hides them so far. Next question, Ralph Putritz. Fascinating talk. You make this prediction that you won't find black holes more than 100 solar masses from this. From stars. Yeah. From stars, yes. Mm -hmm. Any way of testing this observationally in the coming Well, I think the, 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 the gravitational wave um, uh, um, I mean, this is one event at 85 solar masses. Most events um, have, a, have a cutoff at about 40. So if you remove the hydrogen envelope, then you would probably, either because of this uh, pair instability physics or because of wind physics, it would probably be constrained to about 40 solar masses. I think the 85 will be exceptional. Um, but um, if above 100 is... If nature can do that, then eventually they will be found by, by, by LIGO. So that will be a good test for that. We have a long question by Albrecht Kamla. He says, thank you for the excellent talk. I agree with that. Indirect N-body simulations of extremely massive rotating population three stars, uh, flat IMF up to 300 solar masses. We get very recently in December 22 now stars through collisions and mergers with masses up to 5,000 solar masses within two mega years. Are you considering thus 
these stars in your research. We are modeling the stellar properties with recent fitting formulae by Ataru Kanikawa. Sorry, I only got half of it. <laughs> so um, they do n-body calculations, a bit like what we discussed this afternoon, yeah, and uh, they also find runaway collisions. Yes. And they are modeling those with a specific fit formula. And I guess the question is whether you consider this type of stars in your models or what fit formula you might. So far, suggest. not. Um, um, the main effect will be this L over M. You know, the, so if you if you get your L over M right, it doesn't really matter what the mass or the luminosity is. As long as you have L over M right, that should give you the best constraint on what sets the mass or space. Mm -hmm. There are other factors like temperature and so on, but those are like the secondary effects. Mm -hmm. Good. So, uh, so hi, Eric. Thanks a lot for the super interesting talk. I have a question about what you mentioned, the compactness, compactness of the B supergiant progenitor. Uh, since they are more compact than red supergiant progenitors, and therefore more material would fall into the black hole, if understood well, uh, to form the black hole, uh, could you expect that black holes formed by uh, B supergiants would be systematically heavier than black holes formed by red supergiants? Uh, yes, I think he's asking if because of the envelope compactness, well, I didn't mention it, but it's the envelope compactness, um, in this case of this blue supergiant, this is a rather unique situation. Most red supergiants would make Newton stars, of course. Normal red supergiants we see probably make a type 2p supernova and then produce a Newton star. So, so the, the compactness parameter for black hole formation is normally thought of more in the Wolverine, in the, in the stripped part of the universe, sort of the helium universe. Um, so um, in that case, of course, you're already much more compact. So um, um, but, but yes, if you have these stars um, uh, above what locally we call the Humphreys-Davidson limit, but um, then it would still be easier to have something blue uh, collapsing directly to, I mean, at least eating up all the material basically than, than that would be the case for red supergiant, yeah. Well, yeah, so I have a question about the most, so the most massive stars, um, I am uh, expecting them not to form in isolation, right? So the question would be, do we know from surveys um, whether they are surrounded by other less massive, but still massive stars or low mass stars, or how is the environment in the, the populations around the most massive stars? So. R136 is sort of the, the, the big pond I keep talking about. Yeah, the most massive one, A1, is clearly surrounded by other very massive ones. And some of them are actually outside the core. Some of them do seem apparently isolated, like VFTS 86A2. It may well have been kicked out. Uh, um, so I don't think I don't think you could argue that they could not all be formed in the, in the same cluster. Uh, I mean, I think the evidence is still out there. I mean, the question is still out there, but I think most people would think they would all form in the, in the dense core. So next question, Keith Tulemon. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, um, you, you said when you naively you, um, apply stellar evolution without tricks, then you get this kind of strange profile yeah. uh, where the density increases at some point uh, at, at the outer edge, right? Uh, have I understood it correctly? Yeah. Um, Shouldn't that be violently Rayleigh really Taylor and stable? Uh, quite, quite possibly. Um, there is a lot of supporting radiative pressure. Uh, that, so this is just yeah. a 1D model. I'm right. not saying yeah. this is yeah. real, um, right. but um, it's not necessarily excluded even in multi-D. Um, um, okay. I just don't think we, we, I mean, this problem is probably resolved somehow by nature. Um, I, I uh, maybe would expect the, when you have an increase of density, you get these kind of finger instabilities where you... Uh, the quite possibly. Yeah. Um, but I think people who do calculate this in 3D find these super large uh, Rayleigh-Taylor wobbles. So it's like the sun, but the Rayleigh-Taylor parts can cover, I don't know, 10%, 20% individual 
blobs that rise and fall down off the stellar surface. So it's it's really a huge mess. But here, Steffen has been working on that, for instance. So maybe Yorick knows this very well, of course. I mean, this is a feature of this 1D modeling that you do, and this star locally exceeds its adding limit. And that's why then if you want to, again, maintain hydrostatic equilibrium, you build in density inversion, and then in your hydrostatic equilibrium equation, you're again in equilibrium. This is the way for 1D code to find a solution to this problem. And in this case, I guess it would not be really Taylor unstable, actually. But I guess what would be more happening is uh, all these clumping issues, and the wind will find little holes, and it uh, will produce a porosity environment, and then the entire um, dynamics in the stellar uh, uh, envelope is going to be different. But and I think this is what Ralph then mentioned in terms of uh, 3D radiation hydro simulation that have been done exactly of this kind of um, environments. Is that this, you see is this? a simulation by Young? Um, it's the Athena plus plus code. Stone. As a name to, to look into. So, so, so to maybe to add that it depends on where exactly in the star that happens. So, how deep you are, how close you are to the surface, what your opacity is, and the one solution indeed is all kinds of weird uh, convection clumping starting up. The second possibility is what what Yorick essentially mentioned, and what we see uh, if you do this uh, in the kind of atmosphere models that I'm doing, where you allow for a hydrodynamic term that you then simply launch an outflow and that's the other possibility you just launch an optically thick wind your uh this is essentially what happens in a classical war star and also uh, to some degree in this very massive stars that the surface that you see is already a rapidly moving layer and not really a, a hydrostatic cellar surface so that simply means that this kind of structure model is not applicable for these type of stars it's just a question you need to circumvent this somehow if you want to keep doing 1D stellar evolution models, which we have to do for a certain number of reasons. And so you need to then either parameterize your convection or you need to treat the, the, the boundary uh, in, a, in a more hydrodynamic, at least stationary hydrodynamic way. All right. I find it fantastic that your talk triggers such a vivid discussion. I think that is, um, that is excellent. We do not have that so often. Maybe Towards the end, I would also like to sneak in a question. So it's, in a sense, a follow-up on Saskia's question. You had these tracks that, depending on the mass loss, uh, all converge to a value that was around 100, these guys. What sets this value? Is it the original electron-driven uh, radiation So what sets the mass? Uh so what sets this mass limit? They all converge to roughly, what is it, 100, 120? Oh, 100 at some point, you basically, you lose so much luminosity, you lose so much mass, you actually go a little away from the Eddington limit. Yeah. You just have a normal-ish line-driven wind. So, so, yes. so, so this one is just because it has the higher mass, it also has the higher luminosity, therefore it's closer to the Eddington limit. Yeah. It will drop more quickly than the next one, and then the next one. Um, and that is why they can all converge to the same value. Okay, and is this then determined by the classical Eddington limit on electron opacity? No, in all these cases, it's, it's, well, they're all based on mass loss rates that include both electron scattering and line scattering. Okay. But you, you basically have your, your electron scattering, and on top you have what, well, call it gas opacity. Yeah. And, then, and then because of these optical depth effects, you get sort of a boosting factor. So the boosting factor is very strong here, and that, that effect just drops off. And then you basically have your normal, more, more optically thin O-type star radiation okay. wind. Okay, excellent. So last chance for further questions. If not, ah, Fabian. So I have a fun question. Um, if you were to apply these mass loss uh, rates to your uh, 85 solar mass progenitor for this black hole. How, ah. would, how would that play out? Uh, not very well. <laughs> the point, of course, is that is a low metallicity. It's 100th in that model. Um, so here for the 85 solar mass black hole is just a standard think mass loss recipe. And we are really at the boundary where that we would say that is applicable or not. So if that is still applicable, then we be just below that. Um, is it possible that these stars will have higher mass loss rates and not from an 85? It is possible. Um, but but it's it's even if that is the case, at exactly that metallicity, 
if you go to slightly lower metallicity, you will still reach that regime. So the regime will exist, I think, independent of whether we have, in some sense, perhaps slightly underestimated the mass rate if we would do this consistently. So basically, this this formula or this this um, this kind of picture would still remain, but the exact metallicity where this drop occurs would, would slightly shift. With that, Jurik, many thanks for this fantastic talk.